All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out to Cyber Risk Wednesday today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, supply chain uh, security in the 21st century. Uh, and as you may or may not know, uh, April 1st starts Supply Chain Integrity Month. Um, so we're uh, at a very, very timely uh, point in the calendar year uh, to have a conversation about this. Um, I'm Bo Woods. I'll be moderating today's discussion. Uh, we've got a, an awesome panel. I uh, can't wait to tell you about it. We call them the, the Joint Cyber Team over here because all of their initials start with JC. We have a very consistent theme that we like to trot out to the, to the group. Um, so I was at uh, South by Southwest a couple of weeks ago uh, and in a, a conversation with, uh, or in a panel discussion with uh, Representative Hurd and Representative Swalwell. Um, and uh, Heard mentioned something about some of the initiatives that they're rolling out uh, in Congress to deal with uh, you know, cyber supply chain issues. And he said, you know, IT security and IT procurement is nobody's sexiest topic. I still thought, I was like, wait a minute, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so maybe I'm the oddball and maybe I'm the weirdo, but uh, we had a lot of registrations for this. I see a lot of faces in the crowd. So maybe I'm not quite so weird as, uh, as I thought. Um, and it was brought to light, uh, what, yesterday, two days ago, the, the consequences of cyber supply chain issues uh, when you see uh, organizations like Asus and their products um, having a essentially a supply chain attack that impacts a lot of their customers. I think the number was uh, half a million uh, machines were potentially impacted by a spurious download um, for a, a software update. Um, now this is a situation where it was, uh, you know, not counterfeit hardware, not maliciously implanted hardware. This was straight a software issue uh, that was taken advantage of. Um, a few months ago, uh, we had uh, the story of uh, the big hack on Supermicro that maybe or maybe didn't take place. Uh, I think the jury's still out. Um, a lot of people tend to think it didn't, but Bloomberg seems to be sticking by their story. Uh, and it just underscores um, the complexity of these supply chain issues uh, and how hard it is to you know, spot, but also to eliminate them. Um, and I, I've got a, a little analogy that I want to test with you. So if it bombs, uh, just smile and nod politely. Um, so you can look at uh, organizations and operations uh, kind of like a boat, you're rowing across the river or something. Um, and when you have supply chain integrity issues, it's like there's a leak in the boat. So uh, what do you do? What, you ask any, any normal IT person and they say, well, we're gonna bail the water out of the boat. It's like, great, are you gonna fix the holes? Well, that's a procurement problem. We don't need to worry about that. They just buy the stuff. And I think the, the lesson learned from the past couple of years of looking at supply chain, supply chain integrity issues is that it's not just a procurement problem. It's not just about uh, the people who bought the boat um, need to worry about better boats. It's in operation, we need to uh, uh, to reduce the amount of bailing that we do by plugging the holes, by looking for supply chain issues wherever they happen to pop up at whatever phase of the operation they come in. Uh, so what do you think? Did that work or did it bomb? Okay, I get a couple of thumbs up. Good, good. I won't feel bad, quite so bad tonight. Um, <clears throat> so I want to give a, a quick framework to help guide some of the thoughts around supply chain issues and supply chain security in the software era. Um, there's, uh, I would argue, four categories of uh, software supply chain issue that you can have. Um, the four categories are, uh, very briefly, you can have operational supply chain issue. This is, uh, there is a problem in operations after you've got all your equipment stood up and you're running your organization, you're running your primary business mission or primary uh, mission for government, uh, and you can have a a malicious contractor or an accidental, you know, somebody leaves the back door open or something like that, that comes in while you're operating. So that's one type of risk and that's embodied by things like the ACES hack. Um, things like the, the target hack, if you remember all the way back to whenever that was, 2012 or whatever, uh, where uh, target was breached through a supplier for their air conditioning maintenance on the top of their building. Um, you can also have counterfeits. These are things that show up in products that shouldn't be there. Uh, so typically counterfeit is uh, somebody trying to make an extra few pennies per chip that they ship. 
uh, and they rebrand less capable or um, fewer feature chips uh, or software than otherwise you would get. Uh, and that's a, a fairly well-known, fairly understood space that's been studied for many, many years. Then you have uh, what we call malicious taint. So these are issues where it's a, typically a nation state that is deliberately undermining um, a uh, supply chain for their own advantage. That could be a reliability issue. Maybe they want to degrade operations of an organization. Could be for uh, remote access, so they could be putting an extra chip, as in the Supermicro case, allegedly. Uh, but it's typically done by nation states, typically involves some kind of a hardware implant. Um, and then there's a final class or category that I call unintended taint. These are what might be referred to uh, in the um, Executive Order 13800 as known but unmitigated vulnerabilities. These are things that are either shipped uh, with the product or that are revealed over time um, that are either software vulnerabilities or configuration issues that can cause um, uh, severe vulnerabilities in an organization that could impact their reliability. And these are things that anyone could take advantage of. So when there's uh, one of these vulnerabilities published, all of a sudden it becomes a, a foot race between the defenders to patch it, to fix it, and the adversaries uh, who can then take advantage of it, again, for their own gain. Um, but supply chain is a lot bigger than just some technical security issues, right? I think we can all agree that. Um, we have uh, what you might consider a national industrial base uh, here in the United States, and each country has their own. Uh, and these are the things that support life-sustaining capabilities, things like healthcare, things like aviation, things like automotive, um, things like uh, the electric sector. They're the things that keep our nation going. Um, and there's a lot of other potential supply chain issues or potential issues to tackle, such as you know, who owns that organization or owns substantial portions of it. Uh, who are their partners? Who are they letting in the door every single day to come to work there uh, that you might want to look at as su potential supply chain threats? Um, who manufactures the equipment they have? Who provides the teleconference, uh, telecom services that they have? Uh, who is their customer base? Who buys most of their stuff and can dictate the line, their product lines? So these are all broader issues uh, that you could tie into a supply chain conversation. We might do some of that here. Um, but in addition to that, you know, looking more broadly than just our nation, looking across the entire international domain, um, along with some people who would uh, maybe in other circumstances be adversaries, on some of these issues we're actually allies because we have similar sets of adversaries. And I'm not just talking about the big four here. Uh, I'm also talking about uh, criminal adversaries. I'm talking about ideological adversaries and others who want to do each of us harm. We have common markets as well. So we're all trying to same, sell to the same pe people. And if trust is eroded because there are trustworthiness issues, it hits all of our economies just the same way. We have common supply chains. Uh, you know, There is probably not a car on the street outside or a thing here in this building that didn't go through at least five or eight countries before it came to us in its finished form. Um, and then we have common societal goals. You know, maybe not all of them, but where our where our commonality overlaps, we'll be safer sooner working together. Um, so uh, at the Scowcroft Center, we're asking these questions because we want to, uh, to drill into nonpartisan, uh, deeply impactful issues here. Um, we, uh, uh, if you don't, for those of you who don't know, this may be your first time here, the Scowcroft Center um, honors General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and the ethos of that nonpartisan dialogue between multiple parties with the same uh, common interests. Uh, and the Cyber Statecraft Initiative takes the best of that and really infuses it into cyber conversation here in Washington, D.C. in all of its forms and focuses. Uh, luckily, like I mentioned, we've got the A team here. Uh, it's the, the JC team, uh, the Joint Cyber Team. Um, and I'll introduce them very briefly and then give them a chance to, to introduce themselves. You can stop here me talking. Uh, first to my left is Ms. Joyce Carell. Um, Assistant Director for Supply Chain and Cyber in the National Counterintelligence and Security Center as part of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, we have Mr. John Check, Senior Director for Cyber Protection Solutions at Raytheon Intelligence Information and Services. And down at the end, Mr. John Costello, Senior Advisor to the Director at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency housed within DHS. 
I'll moderate the discussion. And one last reminder um, before we begin, this is on the record, it's recorded, it's streamed live. There's gonna be a Twitter conversation. If you are engaging that conversation, uh, please tweet at cyberstatecraft uh, or with the hashtag cyberriskwednesday. Uh, and with everybody on stage here, I will um, let them take turns introducing themselves better than I did and giving uh, some thoughts on what they wanna talk about today. Joyce, Going go to ahead. the left, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you for having me here. Um, Joyce Corral, as he introduced me, I work in the National Counterintelligence and Security Center. And um, there are a couple points I wanted to make um, on, on the topic um, as we you know, briefly talk and some other points I'll bring up as we ask questions. Um, uh, Bo started the conversation by relaying um, a, a vignette to you of a conversation he'd had with a member of Congress, Representative Hurd. Um, this, uh, today, in this, in this day and age, there's a lot of interest from Congress in the area of supply chain risk management, and Senator, uh, Representative Hurd was actually instrumental in uh, uh, moving out on the legislation that the President signed on 21 December, the President signed the Secure Technology Act. Um, <clears throat> the government had worked with the Congress, the executive branch had worked with the Congress during last calendar year to um, work on the language of the legislation that finally came, came out um, at the very end of December and Heard was very instrumental in that. So I'm sure he thinks this is very much a sexy issue now. Um, there are other members of Congress that are interested. Um, just yesterday, the Senate Armed Services Committee, the subcommittee on cyber, had a hearing um, um, with a, um, a couple of members of industry, um, some folks representing trade associations like the aerospace industry, um, NDIA, Defense Industrial Base um, uh, organizations, um, as well as um, a small business um, speaking to the challenges that small businesses face. The, the members of Congress were keenly interested. This is the very beginning of a series of conversations that they're gonna have. So they're, the, the, the Congress is very engaged. Um, the executive branch is engaged. We invested um, heavily um, in um, ensuring that we had the legislative tools that we needed and uh, uh, passing the Secure Technology Act. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, there's a lot of media coverage um, at this point. So I, I would kind of liken where we're at um, at this time on supply chain issues as um, back many, many years ago when um, uh, people looked at cybersecurity and the, and the folks in the industry 20 years ago trying to market their products, uh, trying to drum up business, uh, nobody was really interested uh, broadly in cybersecurity. It was basically considered um, an added cost. Um, it was hard to use, it was hard to understand, and it wasn't really a topic that took off in a more public environment until people began suffering from um, identity theft. And um, people started writing to the members of Congress. Members of Congress became victims of identity theft. And at that point, people realized, you know, the, the average every man needs to actually understand how to protect their data uh, because they may be at risk. And now we are at a point where things are um, at a little farther remove, where we see um, adversaries, whether it's an adversary nation state or um, a, a criminal, someone who's counterfeiting, trying to pocket a little bit of money. Um, we now see people going beyond um, just an actual breach and trying to do something more insidious and use the software supply chain as a platform for another breach down the road. So, so this is an issue that, that people now are gonna need to really begin to roll up their sleeves and pay attention to. On the Secure Technology Act, I'm, I'm pretty sure my colleague from the Department of Homeland Security may comment on this as well. The Secure Technology Act is uh, a statute that will require the government to establish a Federal Acquisition Security Council. Um, the council will create, um, as, as in good government, it will spawn any number of working groups, um, but um, will bring the government further down the road from a policy and process perspective so that organizations will be required to build supply chain risk management programs and begin to better understand what their risk exposure is. So the government is moving out in this area and the government will be funding more work um, in, in better understanding the risk. So we have Congress interested, we have the executive branch interested, and the interest from the industry side is um, uh, stepping up as well in uh, um, industry, certain industries taking um, a greater interest. So the insurance industry um, is stepping up. The, there was an article in today's Wall Street Journal about um, Marsh and McLennan and the Cyber Catalyst program that they're launching conveniently on 1 April, National Supply Chain Month, to begin to improve 
um, cybersecurity and, and tethering cybersecurity from a supply chain perspective. So if you have a sense of confidence that you're doing business with a vendor who has undergone some degree of third party due diligence, you may get more favorable terms from an insurance policy or an insurance claim. So these are things that will play out over time. Um, the Department of Defense has also um, taken steps to reframe how they think of supply chain risk and have um, uh, taken a, gone a step further to talk about security as a new, um, oh, I, I can talk loud enough, um, security as um, uh, the, the uh, fourth pillar. And this phrasing that the Department of Defense uses, we're using it as well in my organization, is a, a characterization that from a government, from a procurement perspective, whether you're a government or private sector, and you think about buying something, um, you're thinking about um, your cost, your schedule, and the performance of the item that you're, that you're receiving, whether it's a, a good or a service. So in, in that, sometimes security gets watered down as a subset of performance or is just um, uh, overlooked completely. Um, as, as everyone here is actually a security professional, in, in the multidisciplinary aspect, security is, is a multidisciplinary field. You know, we all understand, at least in this environment, information security, network security, um, data security. What we also understand when you came into this building, physical security, access to the building. Um, those of us who um, work in government with private sector, we have um, personnel security issues where we want to have um, some sense that uh, we're working with people who you know, don't have a, a uh, sketchy background. So, so there are a variety of security disciplines that need to come into play. So that's, that's an aspect of supply chain risk management that's going to get a lot more attention. And I think when we see non-government um, organizations like the insurance industry begin to think about how to monetize security, that's when you'll begin to see a transformation and you will see uh, 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 organizations make choices to strengthen security and think through how can security be perceived not as something in the loss column or as a cost, but something that can go from the loss to the profit column and be a market differentiator. So I think we're on the cusp, we're on the edge of, of some major changes across um, from things that will come from the Congress, from the lawmakers, from the government demands on the um, industrial base, the national industrial security base, as well as things that will be industry driven. So I welcome any questions as well. You might Thank you. Let's see. Is my mic working? All right. Yeah. So as uh, Bo mentioned, I'm John Check. I'm with Raytheon's Intelligence Information Services Group. I lead the Cyber Protection Solutions Team, which um, focused on defensive cyber. My customers are federal. Uh, state and local as well as commercial customers. So I cover the whole gamut of uh, the you know, public-private partnership perspective when it comes to uh, servicing cyber. Uh, my team covers all aspects of cyber solutions, which would be from you know, assessments to pen tests to red team to digital forensics, incident response, threat hunting, and other services. So from my point of view, what I see most often we go do assessments across that diverse group of uh, customers is that it comes down to a lot of times people just aren't aware. That unintended taint that Bo mentioned, number one, they don't know, they're, people don't recognize there's a patch, don't recognize there's a problem, just uninformed. And that's what we come across and that really turns into a, a training or an education uh, uh, engagement for us a lot of times. It's just the people are unaware. Great to have an, an awareness month for, of April to address this issue. And that's exactly where it all starts. It's like any process, um, you, things have to be started from the very beginning and change management if you, if it, if you let it happen to you versus if it's, you're, you're helping drive the change from the very beginning, totally different outcomes. And with, with uh, the supply chain, that's what we're experiencing right now, trying to uh, fix the sins of the supply chain past just doesn't work after the fact. So people have to be part of the solution up front and that doesn't start unless they understand, okay, what are the concerns? They need to be very informed of you know, not just what John Check and Raytheon understand of our supply chain risks, they have to understand what our risks are so they can be incented to help us meet those challenges that we have, and that really applies to every business. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Costello, Senior Advisor to the Director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It's a mouthful. CISA is a little bit better. Um, so we are the newest and, dare I say, brashest uh, federal agency. Uh, we think of ourselves as the nation's risk advisor. Um, we uh, coordinate federal efforts and with the private sector to ensure the security and resilience of all 16 critical infrastructure sectors. 
What I really wanted to talk about today is how we're seeing, how we've seen the threat change and how we've seen how we need to view risk and how that changed, especially given supply chain. I think we all know that uh, the cyber ecosystem is growing more active and dangerous. Uh, nation states uh, are fully aware that cyber, um, cyber means can be a critical tool of national power, especially to undermine pillars of uh, power of the United States in areas where they are unwilling or unable to compete normally. And we've seen that frequently over the last few years. Uh, most recently, we've seen that with uh, attacks from APT-10, where China has compromised our managed service providers and uh, looked to steal or uh, intellectual property um, from our companies and conduct espionage. And we, we've continued to see that. Um, I'd say the next point I want to bring up is that we've seen risk uh, become far more cross-sector than it ever has been. A large part of this is the fact that our technological environment is growing more dense and the interrelated functions of our critical infrastructure sectors are also becoming far more interdependent. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of like uh, fancy buzzwords, but ultimately what it means is, is, you know, our nation states are not differentiating by sector. They are not confining themselves to the energy sector, to the comm sector, to the water sector. They're attacking a number of them at the same time. We saw that with APT-10, with targeting managed service providers, which hit everything from pharmaceutical, healthcare industry, industry, uh, uh, energy, et cetera. And we're, we're seeing that with our Russian infrastructure attacks from the last few years, where it's not just energy that's being targeted, it's across a number of different sectors. Um, and that's only gonna continue. I mean, as we grow more technologically dependent, um, risk is going to increasingly be shared. Our attempts to try to mitigate that risk has, have largely been focused on, as Joyce mentioned, especially the last 10 years, is securing operations, securing enterprises, and understanding best practices and tools that can help detect a threat and prevent a threat from happening. Now, from a deterrence perspective, deterrence by denial, that makes a lot of sense. Ultimately, we want the adversary to have to work harder and spend more money to try to compromise our systems, and mitigating those risks do that. The pernicious and insidious thing that really confounds our efforts to impose that cost on the adversary is a supply chain attack, because it is extremely scalable. The dollar spent on a supply chain attack, however expensive may be, can scale and can, um, you know, has cascading risk across a number of sectors. So when we're looking to deter that activity and we're looking to try to change our adversary's cost calculus and what they're trying to do, uh, supply chain attack becomes extremely, it becomes a very attractive option. A good example of this is Kaspersky from a few years ago. That was a nightmare made manifest um, where a, a foreign adversary um, leverages one of their, the market presence and technological reach of one of their companies for espionage. Um, and we could see that type of attack happening from other adversaries that we very much care about, who may, might have a larger market pres presence and whose companies have a greater technological reach. So what are we doing about it? For, for one is we're trying to understand risk in terms of functions rather than systems and assets. What that allows us to do is it allows us to look at between the energy sector, the finance sector, comm sector, IT sector, how are, I mean, how are their functions interrelated and self-supporting? And where is the highest and most pronounced area of risk? And what is, a, what is a function that we could all, as an organizing principle, to get around that? We're trying to transcend the 16 critical infrastructure sectors we've traditionally used and try to group these uh, sectors functionally around particular, um, particular functions that underpin, uh, underpin national security and economic security. And it's been a good self-organizing principle. Secondly, as Joyce mentioned, um, the federal government is organizing its own supply chain efforts around the FAST Council, which is like a little bit like CAC card, and it's a little bit redundant, like FASC Council. But, um, and a lot of that is to impose a little bit more order and rigor about, and, and to be honest with you, buy-in and consensus about how we're um, governing acquisition, um, acquisition decisions across the federal government. What um, CISA is doing in particular, though, is trying to bridge the gap between federal efforts and private sector efforts. So we've set up the ICT Scrim Task Force, who has begun its uh, body of work across, uh, across four lines of effort and will continue for the next 90 days. Um, it's 40 of the largest IT and comms companies in the United States. Um, 
as well as 20 of the agencies who make up the FAST Council. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure the work that we're doing internal to the federal government and the work that and how we're working with the private industry that there's a bridge there so that we're all using the same language. And some of the, what we're doing is, to be honest with you, very foundational work. I mean, one thing that I, ca I can mention is, is and how do we describe supply chain threats and how do we ensure we're doing bi-directional information sharing between the federal government and uh, the private sector. Um, putting standards around that and putting a, a common uh, uh, I would say language around that, uh, how we share threats, as well as in getting buy-in from the federal government to do that is absolutely essential. I mean, the final point is, is I, you know, I, I think it's maybe an obvious point, but this isn't something the federal government can do alone. And at DHS, uh, we recognize that, and we're trying to, to have a public-private uh, conversation to try to move this forward. And it does feel like that there is a, ma there is a critical mass here that where we can solve these problems in the next few years. And given the massive changes that are underway against the ecosystem, it couldn't come at a better time. So, yeah. thank you. All right, thanks. That was a, a pretty complete set of explanations across a very wide set of topics. Um, you know, supply chain is is huge. So, as we were having conversations earlier, trying to kind of narrow it down, it's, it's always hard. Um, but John, I want to play on on something you said uh, in your remarks and and throw it to the panel. Is uh, as our supply chains have supply chains of their own, um, you know, you start looking across sectors uh, and even you know, multiple sectors, not just a single one. You you tend to find the same component level uh, capabilities um, in healthcare, aviation, defense, industrial base, everywhere, right? Um, and particularly, this is uh, pronounced in um, you know, computer software or processing chips or things like that. So. If you look at the Heartbleed vulnerability from several years ago, uh, it was really, really difficult to figure out where that vulnerability might manifest, not just across government, but across private sector. Right? If you look at the Intel flaws from last year, um, they weren't quite as uh, widespread, but only because of the uh, attack vector was a little bit more limited, but certainly Intel chips are in everything. So, um, I'm curious to hear from, from every on, everybody on the panel who has uh, looked across different sectors. What do you do, how do you get down into that component by component level to look at supply chain risk, not just within a single organization, but across a nation or across an industry? Or can you get that granular with it? I think there's, um, I think there's pretty, there's institutional limitations, I think, to getting it to that, to that level for everything. Uh, I think one thing you have to do, uh, what we're doing is you, you have to take a func functional approach. And if you're talking about critical infrastructure sectors, you have to look at, you have to stop looking at them as 16 horizontals, uh, 16 verticals, and look at the horizontals. And what you get down to is the technology. Um, I think it's, uh, I think we look at this from a supply side and a demand side um, in, in, in working to solve this problem. From the supply side, we can, we can work with manufacturers to try to, um, uh, to set a uh, you know, baseline level of security, which is a, which is a really, um, which is a difficult term, I think, to use. I, I think, uh, you know, we can help, you know, best practices with, um, with the manufacturers at the component level, um, you know, to, you know, creating like qualified bidder and manufacturer lists to try to, you know, setting like good criteria for what a, a good or, um, uh, I think a good manufacturer could be from which to source your components. I think we could help uh, shape it that way. From the demand side, I think what we're going to have to do, and this is certainly the approach we're, we're, we're taking, is have more public awareness about uh, procurement and acquisition and the right questions to ask and the things uh, and, and good practices and best practices on buying this technology. Um, I think that could help shape the market. I mean, there have been some, uh, there have been some positive movements in the last few years on um, certifications. Uh, which you know have uh, problems of their own, but I mean, is a really good positive step forward. I think so. Um, I, I would frame it just a little bit differently, and and just let's just acknowledge up front that every company is a digital a digital company, and every government organization is a digital organization. Whether you're a technology or organization, or you're you're just um, uh, you're doing some other type of type of business. Every organization relies on their IT system. That, that's that's a given now. So every organization then um, may be touched by the same uh, vulnerability because you gave the Heartbleed example. So to to John's comments about um, 
uh, really understanding who you're doing business with, who, who your third parties are, who your suppliers suppliers are. You know, everyone's inco it's incumbent upon everyone to actually do really good due, due diligence, robust due diligence. And when one performs due diligence, from my perspective in the national security community, you also, uh, Bo, you brought up the super micro example. From my perspective, um, as, a, as sort of a, a, a learning point with that particular event um, that happened last fall, is that um, uh, we had a situation where a, um, uh, uh, an information uh, was in the media, and so in the morning there was an article, you know, about um, Supermicro, about a company, um, some allegations that, you know, possible hardware implants, um, some other companies were, you know, impugned by association, so that led to a lot of consternation. So whether there was truth or, or not, you know, time passed, people were looking into it. Um, what, what actually, the one thing that really did happen that we all really do know is that, you know, within 12 hours of that um, article hitting the media, Supermicro stock price dropped more than 40%. So that's a, that's a significant consequence. And when you think about understanding third-party risk, you also need to understand, is the information I'm getting, you know, is this legitimate information, you know, do, do I understand what I'm learning here? Do I understand the business that my third parties present? So that should lead a government organization or a private sector firm to have a conversation. If I'm doing business with a, a large uh, firm, a large reputable firm like Raytheon, um, and Raytheon has suppliers, I may want to have a conversation with Raytheon to say, for certain requirements that I have, I need you to take an extra step and really look carefully at, at um, who you're doing business with. But for these other things, my risk appetite is much higher. Um, I have less concern. So we need to bring a level of rigor to knowing, knowing the information we have at hand, you know, how, how much rigor went behind that. You know, just um, everything on the internet is not true. Um, so so keep, keep things like that in mind. I mean, and being a little facetious here. Um, but third-party risk and understanding who you're doing business with is the first first step to actually understanding risk because we're all they're all we're all digital organizations. Yeah, I would just add to it. I mean, the the real challenge is I mean, whether it's you know IT systems or not. Every organization, no matter what industry, government, wherever you live, you buy, you consume things. And a part part of that consumption, every single one of those consumption points is a is a risk point. And so I completely agree. I think the, the certifications do help. At least that gives us a foundation to build upon. You can set a baseline from which to grow. And I've been back to something like you know, the Heartbleed example. There are those uh, components that are used across multiple industries. So I mean, one of the approaches I, that, I, that we've been taking, I think needs a more uh, traction, is really what are some of those really pervasive foundational components that cut across everywhere? And let's focus on those. because. Fixing some of those will give us at least a, a good foundation, a good baseline of uh, something that will affect a broad swath of the market versus point solutions. And point solutions is something that kind of the cyber industry has suffered from is that here's a point solution that's going to fix exactly this problem. When we've got an overarching problem, we need global solutions, so we should probably attack those uh, largest areas first, the areas where we know cut across multiple industries. And that's what really moved the ball forward from my point of view. Um, and you know we've been we've been talking about supply chain issues. Uh, I mean, since we've had supply chains, especially global supply chains, so it's more than a decade old. Uh, some of these concepts. Um, why have we not seen broad scale adoptions of the things that we all kind of know to do and have been talking about for a decade? And how do we get there? Get beyond just you know four people on stage saying here's what you should do, writing papers or whatever, to actual adoption. Uh, in organizations and industries and across uh, an entire uh, nation? I, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I, I honestly think that uh, we haven't had, I mean, we, for those of us in the cybersecurity community, we've seen uh, attacks like this or been anticipating attacks like this for years. I think, you know, we're used to, you know, as Joyce said, we're used to uh, personal identity, uh, like PII being taken. Uh, the idea that um, that you are at persistent risk in your enterprise, I think, is something that is still relatively recent. And I think the idea that a component could be compromised and you could have a compromised component in your um, in your enterprise right now is still a relatively new idea. I, I think you know companies are starting to come around that this is going to cost you money, that this is going to affect your bottom line at some at some at some juncture. 
you know, whether it's going to be uh, six months from now, whether it's going to be a year from now, et cetera. It's not just a cybersecurity operations problem. This is a procurement problem. I think a lot of what we're doing, what the DOD is doing, that we're doing, uh, that uh, ODI is doing, and highlighting that this is a, a massive, um, that this is something you need to be aware of and has to be part of your risk management activity is, is a good step forward in, in getting companies to understand that. I think what we're going to have issue with is, you know, it's great to have a fourth pillar as cost, uh, as, excuse me, as security, as something that needs to be prioritized. What, um, what we have to take uh, into account as the federal government is, you know, large companies, big companies, Fortune 500 100 companies are like, yes, we understand that, we can take that into account. But the major gap that we're going to have is, is small and medium-sized companies yeah. um, you know, who still might perform an outsized function from what their market cap would suggest or from what their market presence would, would suggest in our critical infrastructure and uh, work to help them to build capacity to have these programs to be able to make judgments on their own. Certifications help, public awareness helps, tools that we and ODI and the federal government uh, could provide definitely could definitely help. But in my mind, that is one major gap that we we absolutely have to cross. But that the change in my mind is seeing that the, this will cost you money, and that this will affect your operations. Um, I would just add a little from a government perspective on that. It's just hard. It's not intellectually hard, it's bureaucratically hard, because it really is a team sport. To use your analogy, mm -hmm. what we see happening is that you might have all the team members in the boat, and there might be a leak, but the guy holding the oar says, hey, fixing leaks is not my problem. That's mm -hmm. somebody else's thing to do. And people look the other way. So you know, yeah. you know, to, to continue with the corny analogies, everyone has to row in the same direction. So getting people from very different backgrounds who use vocabulary, the same words in very different ways to work together really requires you know, just a lot of you know, um, uh, uh, sweat equity. You, know, you really have to work in a team environment. And that's sometimes just hard to do. Well, I, I, you know, I don't think the, uh, when it comes to supply chain, the three core aspects of supply chain and, and working with your supply chain haven't changed, right? You've got cost, you've got reward, and you have risk. Right now, we've kind of changed the risk from, are you giving me too much product, or am I going to have a product that's going to go bad before I can use it to, so has somebody tampered with my product, right? Is there something going on with my product that's unintended consequences? And the, you know, that, the, the, and the way that's always been attacked is, you incentivize your supply chain to the way that helps you get your job done to where you have the product you need to deliver your customer in the way they expect it and the time they expect it to be delivered and at the cost they want to consume it at. So from my point of view, I, I really think you know, if, you, if I just, just simplify the whole topic down, I really look at it as an incentivization plan. What, that's what needs to happen. And incentive, in, in order to properly incentivize somebody to what, get them to give you the outcome that you would desire, they need to understand where you're coming from. They need to have the same information as you so they understand the risk and what you're trying to desire to and drive to. And that's one of the challenges with the smaller uh, and medium-sized companies. They don't necessarily have the same uh, point of view, same breadth of experiences that some company like Raytheon would have to say, we know all these things. We have seen behind the curtain. We know the things that can happen. And they just don't have that perspective. So I think it's back to when it comes to incentivizing our supply chain, the first step is, they need to be well informed of, here's where we're coming from, here's why we're asking you to do this extra step that might add cost. And when we do that extra step, here's the benefit that everybody's gonna have down the road because we're not gonna have our stock price drop by 40% the next day. We are a trusted supplier to our, our uh, consumers. So I just really get back to that whole incentivization part of it really will drive the behavior. Yeah, and uh, John Check, I'll go back to you. What are some examples of ways that you've seen you know, leadership really internalize the lessons learned and internalize those needs so that they can turn on the incentives? So it, uh, it's really, it's, it's the challenging stuff. So it's the, it's the things like open back, opening back up contracts and trying to renegotiate your supplier contracts, right? That's the last thing any contracts organization or procurement organization wants to do, but that's really where you need to start. I mean, reopening those conversations and really have that, here's the challenge we have, this benefits both of us, here's why we're doing it. So that's one, one of the big challenges, and that's a, that's a conversation nobody really wants to have. It's, a, it's one of those tough conversations, but it's one that's critical to help make a change in supply chain, is having those terms and conditions updated to match the problems that we're facing. So that's a critical aspect of, uh, the next is really incentivization, not just along from a, from a company perspective, but down to the individual. Holding individuals, here's why your role is critical to what we're doing. Here are the things that you need to watch out for and be aware of as you're doing your daily job. Well, don't ask, don't just you know, respond to that email that says, 
procurement invoice due and you know that starts a whole chain reaction of events of having maybe uh, counterfeit uh, product within your supply chain don't you know so it's really you know from a from a macro level of you know working with our supply chain with our with our our subcontractors and, and suppliers to the uh, individual really understanding how important it is what they do and having their awareness and being incentivized for their performance as well along the way of if you meet these certain things if you get you uh, you, know, you know you know one of the classic things you see when you go to a manufacturing site is what you know 100 days without an accident maybe that that'd be a great little sign in an area for uh, in, in the uh, procurement area 100 days without a cyber breach within our in our supplier chain I like that. Right, that's a, but that'd be a, a visible example of something that we know to do in the industry. We just haven't done it, but that really puts it in the individual's uh, line of sight because every day they're reminded by that sign. And you know, mm -hmm. today's my day. I'm going to be really safe when it comes to cyber. Cool. Any other thoughts? So then, if we know what to do, and now we know how to start doing it, how do we catalyze that? What's the? We're in DC, right? So I'll reach for what? What are the policy levers that we have? or um, policy, sig policy level signals, or uh, how can uh, folks who are watching or, or here in the audience today like actually action this and put it into to place? So I can start from just, from, just from, right. from my point of view. It's pretty s simply. So one thing in order to make a change, right? When you're making a change, it does require funding. And you, you ha you can't, it can't be something that well, we, we, get, we have a problem, we just need to do it. To get it going, before it becomes just a normal course, course of work, there, there is an uptick in what things will cost potentially in, in order to add that rigor. But once it becomes a normal course of business, it's like anything else that gets moved along. It just becomes part of what you build into your, your costs and your supply chain. But initially, uh, there will need to be some real thought around uh, zero cost material and things mm -hmm. like that when it comes to procurements will have to be really looked at because that it drives a certain behavior. If you're driving for the lowest cost and there's no incentive for whoever the supplier is to provide you something where they've put in the time and you're holding them accountable obviously for ensuring that their supply chain is trusted and safe. Uh, it has to start with you know, putting the incentives where people can understand them and the clear for me one of the things that we'd make sure we would need to address is that we're putting money against uh, addressing supply chain and until it becomes a normal course of business. I, I'd say incentives, incentives can be a, a carrot or a stick. So, so when, when, when the government, m many times the, the initial assumption when the government talks about incentives is, um, oh, there's somebody who's going to be talking about a regulatory regime. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to be regulated. Everybody wants the flexibility that regulations don't give. Um, the other incentives can be like tax incentives. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, there has been some conversation um, with uh, my colleagues in the Department of Defense, the Defense Industrial Base, um, with the consideration of, you know, maybe if there's some kind of tax write-off or low interest loans for the small companies, you know, to the, the smaller companies that may not have a robust, you know, cyber team, if they had a low interest loan to buy that, you know, buy that kind of a service, um, would that improve their stature from a, a, a um, from a risk management perspective for the larger companies that might want to use them as, as a sub. So, so there are different ways to think about incentives you know, from a government perspective that aren't just you know, thinking about regulatory re regimes, but ways to, to think out of the box. Yeah, I'm glad you covered incentives. Uh, that's always a, a sort of difficult territory to cover. Um, I, think, uh, I think the federal government, I, I think, is doing this, is, is getting out there and sort of handling the problem. I mean, I don't mean to sort of champion our ICT scrim task force, but, uh, uh, you know, bringing together the federal government, across the federal government, and bringing together, you know, the top uh, companies in IT and comms to try to get some, I mean, these, these are very basic, I mean, these are very foundational things, you know, like setting criteria for evaluating threats in ICT product services, you know. Mm -hmm. um, bi-directional sharing of information. Like th those are two work streams that are worth their weight in gold. But I mean, to even have this conversation, as Joy said, we have to have a common language for it. I mean, at a policy level, at an operational level, as a, at, at a tactical level. I mean, we have to establish foundational work from where we all can you know, uh, basically have a basis. Um, and it has to be a government and it has to be private sector together to do that, because you need that, that level of buy-in. From a policy level, I will say this, is that there's a, um, the DOD's conception of a uh, defense industrial base um, as a uh, as as you know as an enabling mechanism for for the military 
it, I think there is a sort of parallel uh, formulation that I think the federal government is, 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 is lurching towards, which is a national industrial base, yeah. where you have you know, the suite of these technologies and infrastructure sectors that are underpinning you know, pillars of national power, national security, economic mm -hmm. security. Now we know economic security is national security from our uh, national security strategy. But looking at these as you know, you know, making sure we're securing the operations of a critical infrastructure sector, which also DOD does for the DIB, but we're also securing the integrity of that sector as an industrial base itself. You know, looking at the idea of national resilience as, of course, you know, national resilience, we should be able to resist an attack. We should be able to quickly recover from an attack from an operational standpoint, but also the availability and the reliability of materials and components that form that critical infrastructure. Can they be said to be resilient? Are we resisting, you know, from a supply, from a supply standpoint, are, or do we have the reliability and the availability on the supply chain to make sure that in, the, in a crisis or whatever, that our nation is resilient? And uh, I think from a policy level, you know, sort of looking at that, having those conversations in earnest is, is a good step forward. Yeah, and uh, I think there's also some talk around um, having, uh, looking at the supply chain of the things that the federal government buys as a, uh, you know, maybe a carrot shaped stick, an incentive but also uh, uh, a limiting factor if you're trying to sell to the government. I think there's a couple of pieces of legislation. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to questions uh, after this question. Uh, so just going down the line, what do you think is the most underappreciated supply chain topic today? Maybe something we haven't touched about. Pass for me. Uh, so, okay, okay, one thing we didn't touch on is uh, really supply chain resiliency. So you get back to the boat analogy, right? There's no ship that goes out that doesn't have a bilge pump, right? You, you know water's going to leak, so you already build that in. You're not sitting there thinking, okay, I'm just going to drive around and it's never going to leak. You have a bilge pump that's, you're, you're expecting that to happen. So that's one of the things we didn't really touch on is really that supply chain resiliency. We know things are going to happen, so that's, we get to put things into place where we have critical supply chain choke points that will address if one of those points has a problem, what are we going to do and how are we going to respond and ensure that our supply chain still functions, albeit maybe in a degraded state, but it will continue to function and have that resiliency it needs to keep moving. How do you balance uh, resiliency with efficiency? Because they, they can seem to be at odds. Well, that, that, well that's the, absolutely. That's a, having the disaster recovery site always adds additional cost mm -hmm. to whatever you're trying to, do, trying to uh, resolve. And that gets, gets back to my point around kind of the incentives. If it's important to us, we should invest in it. And I think there are some concrete actions you could, we could take with existing resources, uh, depending on what the components are and what the, what the supply chain is, to build in that resiliency based on identifying who are the suppliers. Are they all located in the same space? Do they all consume the same power from the same companies? Do they all have the same water feeds, right? There, there are things we could do to identify that that would help mitigate it, at least understand if this goes down over here, we know somebody else over here that may be unaffected. Okay. So they're in a different uh, grid. Um, I, I think there's ex excellent points. Um, I would also say that something that's underappreciated, I believe, is that um, most of our decisions are gonna be made in the absence of perfect information. You know, because this is really about risk management, not risk avoidance. So when, when we think about how, um, how we make those choices, I, I think it's, an, it's underappreciated that um, we, have, um, we have a strong culture in our industry and uh, in, in our country for understanding financial risk um, or, or for understanding physical, physical security risk. But in this environment where you're relying on a third party and you know, you're, you're buying stuff from a third party because you don't make it yourself or you don't really understand it or you want the convenience of getting it from someplace else, you just, you're not gonna have that, that expertise. So how, how is it that you can evaluate your risk appetite? How can you reevaluate what your risk exposure is? And I think that, that's like a little blind spot a lot of us have that I think is, is um, we're, we're now something we're now beginning to kind of think through. Um, I think Joyce and John did a fantastic job. Uh, <laughs> little power to add or detract, from, a lot of power to detract from that. But I, I, one thing I just wanted to emphasize is, uh, I mean, really public awareness. We've seen that work um, in working with our stakeholders. People love stories. Stories show consequences very easily. And 
you know, having a good set of case studies, you know, while tragic and, you know, costly as they may be that they ever happened, are extremely useful for the federal government to show, you know, this is where something went wrong, this is where, this is how we can help, and this, this is the impact and cost to you and your business. Telling those stories and making sure people are aware of that is extremely vital in making sure that this continues to be a high priority for businesses, you know, small, medium, and large. So that's something that we are going to champion and make sure that we, um, we get out there and the public narrative is aware of that. Again, not to demonize any you know, vendor, any country whatsoever. We just want to make sure that people are aware of what could happen, the impact of them, and what it could cost them. So cautionary tales as an inoculation against other uh, industries or sectors. Let's hope there are no anti-vaxxers in the crowd. Um, all right, we're going to go out to questions. Ooh, we got a bunch. Let's see. Uh, I see somebody standing up over here. You're very eager to talk. So Sony didn't want to spend $10 million to fix a $1 million problem, and then they found out the hard way that it was a much bigger problem than a $1 million problem. For critical national security systems, are we going to actually um, undo the 20 year ago decision to stop manufacturing chips on shore where we couldn't supervise their production from sand to completion? Um, so, so, uh, so that's a, that's a, that is a challenge um, looking at um, how we source um, w as a as a government or a national security community uh, sourcing microelectronics and you know what can be done to have a better understanding of risk and and also have access to state of the art microelectronics. So um, I know that in conversations with my colleagues at the Department of Commerce and other organizations that have a a, a stake in in uh, the um, innovation ecosystem. That's, that we are beginning to look at um, what other alternatives there are. Um, this administration is, is um, uh, and we've heard Vice Pre President um, uh, Pence make these comments, um, characterizing uh, the environment we're in as one of Chinese economic aggression. So how in the face of that you know, do we um, look at our industry? How do we incentivize you know, more domestic manufacturing? Um, I know my colleagues at the Department of Energy are looking at you know, manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing industry, whether it's advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing. You know, what, are ways, what are ways to you know, better incentivize that? And it's not to bring back on shore something from 20 years ago, but what is exactly that we want today? I don't, I don't want something that was made 20 years ago. You know? so, so people are kind of trying to think through how, how to do that in, in a manner that makes sense, um, is, is affordable, and, and where there is a commercial appetite to, to purchase, to purchase those goods that would come out of those manufacturing environments. Is that like the uh, artisanally crafted microchips, like <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> hi hipster IT? <laughs> So I, I would point to, um, you know, the White House put out an, ex um, an executive order on, you know, assessing, assessing and um, assessing the um, manufacturing and industrial, defense industrial base and supply chain resilience. And that level of effort is um, uh, started a couple of years ago, you know, is, has led to a number of different things to really examine what is it that we want domestically. Um, from a supply chain risk management perspective, you know, um, uh, Sourcing, you know, something in one location is not a panacea. You know, this risk management is, you know, sort of defense in depth, full team approach. You know, but 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 there are efforts underway to address the question you asked. Did you have something? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd piggyback off Joyce's uh, comments. I mean, I think this administration recognizes that, you know, it's it's important to play defense, uh, but it's also important to, you know, to look at positive ways we can, you know, ensure not only domestic but trusted uh, lines of supply for some components. You know, even high tech ones who've been effectively commoditized that they can be switched, and whether we can find, um, you know, trusted sources. You know, how we can make sure. I mean, th to me, it's a resilience issue. Um, you know, for both for safety and security, you know, times, you know, good times and bad, we want to be able to make sure that we have a trusted way we can get those components and we are, can rely on those components and that, that, that source is not going to go away or not going to be uh, subject to the, you know, vicissitudes of, um, of international relations and, uh, and, and conflict. Okay. Uh, we've got one up here. And when you get the microphone, just say your name and affiliation. Hi, uh, Sean Lingus with CyberScoop. Um, I wanted to ask about 
um, technical question about signing digital certificates. You know, some of the most effective, insidious compromises of the supply chain in the last 10 years have come through when the attackers um, get a hold of the digital certs and sign them with, you know, making the the update or what have you look authentic. That happened in what was revealed this week with the hack of, of uh, Aces. I wanted to get uh, Joyce's perspective and John. Uh, as John C. John Costello's perspective on the risk management from the federal side of that, and then uh, of course John Check, you want to chime in on that, and and Bo, you probably have thoughts on the technical aspect of, of doing that. I mean, there are um, ways to sort of ensure the integrity of that. Uh, people have argued, but it's really tricky. I'm wondering how you how you tackle that. Hmm. So. Um I, I don't know. Um, I would have to defer, you know, such a question to actually my colleagues who work at organizations like the National Security Agency or Department of Commerce NIST on um, standards for digital certificates and ways to have assurance that you're sourcing, you know, the, the underpinnings of trust um, and what your trust models are. Um, I do know that there has been a lot of conversation um, uh, in the area of um, uh, ways to provide assurance you know, through the things that you bring in, whether it's a, 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 a digital certificate or it's a piece of software. Um, the research community out of DARPA is looking at ways to do that. Um, people are looking at ways to um, uh, use, you know, use technologies to have attestation that something that came from a source is what you received. So I think people are, are, are kind of getting at the issue. Um, which you're, you're illustrating an issue that is a breach of trust at a very fun, fundamental level. So I think people are looking at other trust models to try to um, uh, uh, mitigate or um, find alternatives or ways not to be uh, fooled by somebody masquerading in that fashion. Um, I, I'd really echo Joyce's comments. Uh, at, at, at that level of technical level, you know, I'm a simple country policy person. Um, but <laughs> with a technical background, but uh, I, I, I mean, I will say, and this is to say nothing of anyone's particular practices, but something we have seen before, you know, from the DHS side, supply, what we call supply side security is incredibly important, um, especially if you are doing, if, you know, if you are continually ma making updates and, um, you know, and patch updates to a particular product that we know is in, you know, federal systems or, 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 pr or private sector systems is making sure that your, your cybersecurity best practices are extremely, and your cybersecurity in general is extremely important because you know, a stolen certificate um, could be used to, you know, to leverage that inherent trust you have with your customer to uh, do, you know, do malicious things. Um, so a lot of that is, you know, is working with those companies to make sure that you know, they're adhering to cybersecurity best practices, they have the tools that they need. Um, in addition to, at a technical level, trying to find a better trust model that, uh, that can be leveraged so that um, you know, someone can't steal the keys to the kingdom. Yeah. Um, and I'll say that you know, uh, secure updates is one thing we actually know how to do really, really well uh, for the best of the best. Um, for others, we've seen problems over the last few years with securing updates and securing an update process and pathways. Um, as more things are connected, more things are software driven, updates become an absolutely critical linchpin. Uh, and there's some open source uh, standards. Uh, Uptain is the one that comes to mind immediately that's specific for the automotive industry, but it's derived from another one that I, I forgot the name of it, uh, but I'm sure somebody will tweet it out. Um, but uh, those are things that generally we know how to do fairly well. It's just implementing them in practice that's the, the hard part. All right, I'm going to go towards the back. Yes, back there. And just again, uh, name and affiliation. Hey, Pete Sorrentino. I'm with Expanse. Um, so this is kind of a wonky question, but we're the Atlantic Council, so I think you guys are going to be good. But it speaks to one of the impactful stories that uh, may or may not be illustrative. But I'm curious to kind of put this to the group and see what you think about it. Um, there was a GA, I believe it was a GAO case in May of 2018 relating to um, Social Security Administration's requirement for an enterprise-wide uh, basically printers, um, and among, in addition to best value criterion price, they had an evaluation criterion for um, supply chain risk assessment, which was like individual and separate from those other two. And the apparently successful offer, which is one of the big um, hardware software resellers in, in the Beltway, um, they won on the other two criteria, but they ultimately lost and protested them, or let's say didn't lost, but they protested themselves to the agency 
saying that um, you know that they didn't follow the solicitation procedures correctly, but what ultimately happened was that they proposed Lexmark printers, um, basically produced hardware, firmware, software in one of these big four countries, and Social Security Administration, which farmed out that particular SCRA requirement to their InfoSec office versus their acquisition office, which is actually a very enlightening thing to do, and I'm curious if you guys would want to comment on that from a uh, government perspective, but um, ultimately this was a case where the agency was leaning very far forward, taking kind of a first-class approach to um, the, the supply chain issues involved in this type of procurement. And I just wanted to put that to the group and see what you thought about that and what lessons we can take away from it. That is a really I'm walking question. I'm not actually question. sure You're what right. the question is. Yeah. Um, is. Is the question about GAO or about the Social Security Administration? It's about their, their approach to the acquisition um, and whether or not you think that is the best practice to have a separate evaluation criterion for supply chain risk assessment outside of the best value of the um, so, so as a, as a government, um, we want to harmonize um, across the government best practices. So if in that example, of which I'm, I'm not familiar with the details of the example, and what I do know, I'm not an acquisition professional, but what I do know is that the federal acquisition regulations are very complicated. Um, <laughs> Uh, so so as, as a government, when the Federal Acquisition Security Council is actually launched, um, we will see guidance coming from OMB, from the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, that will begin to put out best practices and contract language. And however, however you, you, one organization has their best athlete that can you know, bring some expertise to bear on a particular risk management, deci the decision analysis, you know, um, whether you go to your cyber team or you go to your acquisition team or you go to um, uh, another element within your organization or maybe you go to your general counsel. You know, you, you may have a you know, tech savvy general counsel. Uh, that's, you know, up, up to an organization and a mission owner. Uh, but but we're, we're going down the road as a government to try to come, at, to come up with ways to, you know, get beyond just lowest price technically acceptable for some, some uh, you know, clear risky areas that would take you to a best value solution. Yeah, there was a, uh, I was in a discussion the other day with uh, Czech Republic and they were talking about um, some of their procurement uh, guidelines that they pushed down from their uh, cybersecurity agency. Uh, and in that, uh, I believe they included something like what you're talking about, which is like a supply chain risk assessment. Um, what is the supply chain risk to the nation? Uh, and they said that that's actually led to some uh, changes in procurement. So they've stopped procuring from certain vendors or you know, certain resellers or doing service with certain companies. So it actually has changed the calculus on that side. All right, next question. All right, we'll go back up front here. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an Intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I'm thinking that uh, greater utilization of blockchain may solve a lot of his problems there, uh, including uh, updates uh, to software. Um, in, in biology, we refer to the limiting nutrient as some incredibly small thing without which uh, a vitamin falls apart and you die. Uh, you have a trace need for magnesium, for example. And if you can't get magnesium, y you and every other human is dead. Um, this is completely analogous to micro requirements in particularly national security uh, equipment. And I'm wondering if a, uh, a bad actor, uh, let's pull China out of the hat, uh, succeeded in cutting off completely our supply of, let's say, vanadium, and uh, pressured every other vanadium supplier to not give us vanadium. If that sort of uh, gross attack on the supply chain should be met by a US attack on something in the Chinese supply chain, a massive campaign of uh, cyber activity against China? Do at some point we cross over to limited kinetic response? And should we be drawing some of these red lines now before it happens 10 years from now in a environment where we really are hassling with China? Uh, I know that there's uh, a couple of folks up here who probably can't jump on that grenade for obvious political reasons, uh, unless you want to. I, I think I will say as a general point that I think the, the government is well aware um, that there are certain components and materials that we need to maintain a reserve of 
um, uh, and we need to make sure that we maintain positive control of that are necessary for our national defense. I will say that as I can't speak to any particular response options or um, how we would respond if those were cut off. Now, so let me take a, a less literal response. Um, I, I do like your biology analogy. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to mull that one over. Um, so, so as, as a government, when we think, you know, from a, a, a policy perspective and policy levers, you know, we really want to use whatever the policy tool that's available to us is the one that is most effective. So, um, in certain situations, the Department of Treasury may sanction a particular company. Um, so we see um, that the Department of Treasury has uh, sanctions authorities related to cyber activities. Um, we see um, last year the Department of Justice, you know, um, with the indictments of the, um, uh, the APT actors with regard to uh, attacks on the managed service providers, you know, took some actions um, at, at that kind of a level. So, so as a government, um, one of the reasons that we pursued a statutory authority to create this Federal Acquisition Security Council that has a representation from the whole government is that when we come to think through some of these complex questions, we do begin to think about what, what will be a red line you know, that, that would be unacceptable and we develop that policy. And then we also think through, you know, what, what tools and what levers make the most sense in a particular situation. Yeah. Uh, come back up front. Hi, uh, I'm Larry Clinton. I'm with the Internet Security Alliance. We've been writing about cybersecurity supply chains for like 20 years. Uh, and I want to thank and congratulate the panel on a couple of really key uh, items. I think the discussion of incentives is exactly right. I think public awareness is great. I think the comments you made about uh, uh, moving to a functional as opposed to sector analysis, also great. All that being said, I feel I really have to caution heavily against what I feel is um, at times a, a real oversimplification of the problem and frankly creating what I personally consider a dangerous conception of the progress we're making with all respect, we don't know what to do with respect to securing our cybersecurity supply chain. The economics of this issue are not going to turn in our favor. The economics of supply chain work entirely in the other direction. We've seen lots of companies with their immediate stock fall uh, after an event. The stocks always rebound much higher. We're even seeing people manipulating stocks uh, so they can short them. Um, and while I'm a big fan of CISA and the Risk Management Center, I participate in a lot of that, big fan of it, but we're nowhere near actually working towards solving this problem. My concern is that in our efforts to do awareness and talking about all the really good things we're doing, we're given the impression that we are really turning the corner on this, and I just don't think that's true. I think we are losing the cybersecurity battle Badly, we are falling way behind, and supply chain is one of the areas we're the most far behind. So I would just caution everybody that while it's great to that all the stuff you're doing, we're supportive, we have to let everybody know this is not working in our favor. We have to do much more. We have to spend much more money. We have to be much more urgent about this. We have to be much more sophisticated about it. You've got to do a lot more than just talk. Uh, to who you're doing business with. These supply chains are hundreds of companies long, multiple countries. We don't have the visibility through them yet, and, and we don't have the, the economics of this yet. So I applaud everything you're doing, but I really think we have to check ourselves a little bit at the door in terms of our enthusiasm. Thanks. Yeah, I'd say uh, I think you're right in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we don't know all the things to do in, in supply chain, but we know a lot of things that reliably fail, and we can at least avoid those. Um, today, we're not really doing that, though. So, right, we need to get into the, the conversation earlier. We need to take that great ideas and thoughts from a bunch of talking heads on stage and put it into action, right? Um, I'll also uh, put in a plug for a really good program that Alan Friedman at NTIA is running on software bill of materials. The idea is if you look at software components, how can you trace them and track them down to uh, you know, where they originally came from? Um, and that's primarily, where we've seen that done in industry, it's been done for economic reasons, because it's way cheaper if you know what's good and bad in your software, for agility reasons, so you can hit your customers' demands a lot easier, whether they're internal or external customers. Uh, and they're just starting to use that for security, to be able to peer into that supply chain and see those components and know that they are trusted and trustworthy. I, I think you left something off out of the, the uh, 
the the more you know, you know let's check the enthusiasm you know from a, a, a characterizing the challenge and, and that's that industry is very dynamic so when when if you really reach a point where you have transparency into your supply chain and you you can acknowledge that yes you know sometimes you know the supply chain is you know quite long might be a hundred hundred companies in it you also have to add to that that the um, industry is very dynamic and you may get into a contractual relationship with one vendor thinking they have two suppliers and then by the end of the contract negotiations when you come back to the table to renegotiate those terms, those terms and conditions, you may be dealing with a completely different entity. So it's a dynamic environment and I think um, mm -hmm. we, uh, we need to acknowledge everything that you said um, and, and think to you know, how, how in our understanding of risk is resilience going to be um, uh, and, and, and a, and a, a reliable a reliable um, uh, thing to to uh, keep us from uh, suffering too uh, too much of a consequence you know it's, it's not um, uh, there's there's no civil bullet the, you know this is really about capacity building you know capacity building and resilience is is w w sort of the long distance the long distance uh, race that we have to fight here yeah, and I'm glad Joy said long distance race. I, I don't think any of us meant to mischaracterize or characterize in any specific way. I mean, I think we know that we are step one or two into a marathon. We're just stretching. Yeah, we're just stretching. yeah and, or we're stretching. <laughs> but I mean, uh, um, and there are going to be hills in this marathon, and there's going to be logs in the, in the road, and there's going to be ways to get lost. There's no doubt about that. But I, I will say this, it does feel like there is a critical mass where we're, we're trying to answer some of these problems and you know, answer some of the key questions we need to answer and move forward. I mean, that, and that's happening even across interagency and at the policy level. And um, I'm sure we'll see that in the, in the coming year. So I am confident. Uh, I do appreciate your point of view on, on it because um, I think we've heard you know every few years supply chain comes up and it's like yeah we need to solve this problem but it does it does feel different and uh, I mean we're stretching really really well and we're ready to run the race. <laughs> All right, uh, I want to go over to this side of the room and then come back to you and then we'll ping pong back and forth. So back over here there was a question. I'm Jared Munchheim with Rand Corporation. So we talked a lot today about how to deal with suppliers, but there's a huge supply chain issue associated with what happens when there aren't any suppliers. So for example, a lot of weapon systems that DoD relies on needs computer chips that are 30 to 40 years old. There's just no business case for producing those chips. And there's lots of other examples that we could go through as well. So I'm curious from a government perspective, what's the best way to deal with that? There's no best way. You know, you're probably um, in the microelectronics industry, you're probably well aware of what the Defense Microelectronics Activity does. So, the, you know, the government does have a way to, to has, understands that uh, from a sustainment perspective, that they have to be able to produce those microelectronic parts that are necessary for defense, defense you know, weapons platforms. So that's, that's always going to be something that the Department of Defense is going to have to resource. No, I think you, I mean, you covered. I mean, it's, it's 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 one of those things. There is no good answer. I mean, that's so, just a one of the things we have to deal with. And the the alternative is modernization, which if there's a cost benefit analysis between trying to maintain the old versus build something new. Hipster chips, artisanally crafted microchips. It's going to be the way of the future. And right. manufacturing. Yes, <laughs> right in the front row here. Hi, Derek Johnson, FCW. Um, you have two federal bodies uh, that have come online in the last year, the ICT Supply Chain Task Force and uh, the Federal Acquisition Security Council. Uh, the Supply Chain Task Force sort of rolled out before we necessarily knew that the Secure Technology Act was going to pass. So um, what kind of conversations do you all have? How do you look at um, the different work streams for those two bodies um, such that um, you're each delivering unique value um, while at the same time uh, not uh, duplicating or stepping on each other's toes. Is it that distinction that you talked about earlier where um, you know the supply chain task force is more outward looking in terms of engaging with the private sector and the, uh, the Federal Acquisition Security Council is more looking at kind of the levers of uh, federal acquisition regulations and things like that or is it more than that, less than that? Uh, wait. Yeah, so, so the statute, um, uh, I'll say a little bit from the statutory perspective and then let you talk to the ICT Scrim Task Force. Um, so the statute, you know, does create, um, uh, does have it in uh, a requirement for the government to um, get private sector consultation. 
So, so we, we look to what are the different um, uh, public private sector venues that make sense that, that we can bring in. Um, the statute was passed in December um, and it was signed by the president the night before, the, the night before the partial government shutdown. So when the scrim task force was kicked off, these, these things will sync up. So I will say um, the, the, the FAST Council is intended, I mean, it, Joyce really nailed it and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do a little Cliff's Notes version. It's intended to harmonize approaches to uh, supply chain risk management across the government, to work on uh, you know, acquisition regulation and, um, and to uh, really to help set a standard to you know, create a mechanism by which we can more reliably you know, identify exclusions um, or you know, major threats to a federal supply chain. The ICT Scrim Task Force is intended, I think, as a more general, is a far more general, I'm not going to say boil the ocean, but it, a lot of it is foundational work. And like I said, is you know, figure out how we do uh, bi-directional information sharing on supply chain threat. What does that even look like? How do we even standardize that? Like we're doing like six taxi and like uh, indications of compromise. Like how do we do that? Obviously that helps out the, the federal effort because that's something we can push straight into the FAST Council and, and set that as a standard across the federal government. Um, you know, uh, another is, is, you know, looking with industry to establish criteria for ICT, um, you know, for, you know, threats in ICT products and services. Again, you know, establishing that criteria. And, you know, the, the FAST members are all on the ICT Scrim Task Force. But setting that criteria is something we can roll into the FAST Council as well and harness that work. I think what we recognize is, is you know, we've got a few different challenges here is that, you know, how, just like we did back in, you know, 2014, 2015 with trying to harmonize cybersecurity approaches across the federal government through OMB and through DHS, that we've really got to do that with supply chain and how we're doing acquisition, especially on, um, um, on, on you know, ICT uh, products. So that is our major challenge with FASC, but that still remains a really, really good um, vehicle and mechanism to take things we're getting from the ICT Scrim Task Force, which we need industry buy-in anyway, and, and, and push that and have that, you know, harmonize and uplift the federal government and how we deal with those things. I hope that answers your question. Do you feel like those work streams are, are distinct enough to where you're not, you know, where that's that each other's toes? No, I don't think we're, I'm, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, the, the, the um, I'm on the Scrim Task Force. The, the long-term intent and the, the, the um, establishment of these things, the synchronization, you know, didn't didn't um, happen smoothly due to the partial government shutdown. Um, the the intention is that the uh, public private sector conversation that the Scrim Task Force allows enables the government to hear from industry and to work with industry, yeah. and that will be a voice for industry to inject into the council deliberations. So that's one of the public private sector mechanisms. There are certainly other other venues that that the government works with, like NDIA or AIA. There are other organizations, and then even if um, one goes down a path of some type of a regulatory change. So if there's an update to the federal acquisition regulations, that will require um, the government embarking upon a rulemaking process that always includes some type of public comment period to it. All right, we'll go back over here. Hi, uh, my name is Jack Rapansky, unaffiliated. Um, is there any kind of a maturity model developed uh, with, with actual metrics so that you could, for example, say, how mature is this vendor with, you know, and what level are they at, are at, and how do you actually measure that? I mean, has there been work in that area, or is it still too early in the, uh, in the foot race? Uh, so so there, there, the, you know, the concept of a maturity model is not, not a, an original concept, and I think one of the first things that you know, the government private sector did was a few years ago with the energy sector and the electric sector for cybersecurity developed a capability maturity model. So that's a concept that a lot of people are looking at as a way to evaluate uh, performance, whether it's um, a capability, a, a, um, uh, something that is used to evaluate company performance. You know, there's a lot of discussion on scoring mechanisms. You know, should there be some type of scoring? You know, the, um, as I described early um, at the very beginning, the, um, uh, the um, Marsh, Marsh and McLennan uh, uh, Association of Insurance Industries is looking at um, a cyber catalyst program that may lead to some evaluation criteria. So there's a, there's a role for scoring, there's a role for um, uh, capability maturity model, but there's not like one thing that's really, really well evolved and clearly defined that we can point to at this time. Um, the NIST cybersecurity framework has a maturity model associated with it as well, which is for operations. There's one that's uh, private sector led that's called BSIM uh, that's 
more tailored for products. I think it's BSIMM. Um, and uh, that's got some maturity uh, associated with it. It's just strictly for cybersecurity. So there's some things around it. Um, I don't know of any product related or procurement related uh, maturity models, uh, but I would, I'd very much like to see what that would look like. All right, uh, we've probably got time for two more questions. Who's gonna be? None? Okay, go here. Thank you, my name, is this working? My name is Tom Topping, I'm with FireEye. And my question is, you mentioned some levers earlier that would change the fundamental economics of, of the marketplace to sort of drive the right behavior. Uh, do you have some obvious examples of those or some of those that might be or are being considered? Um, you can pull on the traditional ones, right? Like regulation is a lever that would change the economic model. Um, there's a, a UK code of practice for IoT out there right now, which they're getting ready to turn into essentially uh, market availability guidance. So if it's on the market, um, does it have, uh, does it adhere to these principles? Yes or no, right? Uh, so it's a way to, to essentially uh, raise the bar, uh, or raise the tide line for cyber hygiene for just the real basics, right? Um, there's some others like uh, insurance model, which can change the economics of things. Uh, if, you know, uh, like uh, insurance did 100 years ago or so with Underwriters Laboratory, will this catch on fire in normal use or not? like some basic stuff. So UL has a 2900 series that they've got um, that's not being, being widely adopted yet. Um, uh, then there are, uh, you know, regulation or rules requirements. Um, the FDA, for instance, has pre-market guidance for cybersecurity and medical devices uh, that's actually pretty powerful uh, to be able to say, you know, you've gotta be this high to get into a public safety, um, public health role within the healthcare ecosystem. Um, so there's a handful. Uh, I, I hope to see a lot more that work on that economic lever uh, in a non, um, you know, more carrot, less stick. I've had some conversations with um, uh, colleagues about um, in, in how one thinks about risk. So in this environment, should we think about products that uh, in, in a way where someone has to prove that the product is safe to use or prove that the product is not harmful. So that, that, that's something to kind of you know, hurt your brain you know, later in the day you know, as you go to happy hour. But um, uh, one of my colleagues in the conversations on, on tax incentives and, and these uh, uh, different ways to change the market said, you know, if there's a class action lawsuit because someone suffers a, 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 is a victim of a cyber breach, you know, we, we as a country have continued to accept the fact that um, software um, we, we, will, we will take flawed software and accept that, you know, we'll just wait for the next release to improve it and the next release and the next release. And we just live that way. You know, so, so is that an acceptable way to live? So that's a, I think that's a, that's a question that, that um, is, a, is a question for industry and a question for consumers. I'm, I know that the lawmakers are, are going to be looking at that. But I'm pretty sure organizations um, in the regulatory environment like the Federal Trade Commission are going to be looking at things like that from a consumer protection perspective. Yeah, I think uh, there was a, a paper several years ago by Richard Danzig, surviving on a diet of poisoned fruit, that kind of talks about that. Um, and we did a paper uh, a few years ago with Jay Healy on, uh, are the economic benefits of the internet better than the economic costs? So there's a lot of those types of conversations. I think, um, you know, if we had uh, good rigorously collected scientific information on what works, what doesn't, I think that would change the economic structure. So if we knew that, you know, patching could solve, I'm, I'm making numbers up, right? But you know, patching could solve 40% of your problem and uh, changing default passwords could solve another 40%, then you get to a, a place where um, it's, uh, it really informs buyers and you can get rid of some of the obvious supply chain issues, um, at least at the top layer. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that real quick mm -hmm. is, I mean, that's exactly, you know, one of the benefits and why you see the big push around DevSecOps, yeah. right? Building that security right up front to help, you're not gonna solve all the problems that are going down the road, but you're gonna start mitigating those and make it part of the beginning of the conversation. Back to what I stated earlier, change management 101, 
make change happen with people, not to them. And that's get the DevSecOps having that security right baked into the very beginning of what you're developing. And that should, that's a, that's a lesson learned, right? It was originally DevOps. And people realize, well, we're forgetting something. We're leaving ourselves open. Maybe we should change how we're doing things. Yep. Uh, and with that, we're at 530. And that is all for us for today. But thank you very much for coming out. Uh, if you want to tweet later, uh, at uh, Cyber Statecraft or um, Cyber Risk Wednesday hashtag. So thank you very much. <laughs>